located in British Columbia, Washington, Idaho, and Montana, lies the only known inland temperate rainforest in the world. Similar to coastal rainforest, this is an area of immense biodiversity. The ancient cedar hemlock forest along the valley bottoms is home to monumental trees, some of which date back to the Roman Empire. An estimated one-third of North America's fresh water is supplied and filtered by the inland tempered rainforest. Studies indicate that old-growth rainforest stores more carbon per acre than any other vegetation on the planet. Over the past few decades, most of the accessible valleys in British Columbia have been clear-cut. This great old-growth forest and its wildlife and biomass have largely disappeared. Today, there are a few scattered pockets of old growth remaining. The Nkamaplu River Valley in British Columbia is home to one such refuge. It may be legally clear-cut at any time. My name is Riel. That's me in the black hat. That bearded mountain man next to me, that's Craig. You'll meet him in a few minutes. I live in British Columbia, Canada, and my passion is exploring remote wilderness areas of my native province. Please allow me to share with you one of the most magical places on our planet, the Ankamaplu River Valley. There are two reasons, well, actually three reasons, why I made this film. First, I want to raise awareness of the Nkamaplu River Valley, but also the inland temperate rainforest as part of the larger whole. Second, through this awareness, it is my desire to encourage people to become proactive, to educate themselves, 
and to help protect what little remains of the magnificent old growth forests of the inland temperate rainforest for future generations. And the third reason, plain and simple, is I knew it would be a lot of fun. The inland temperate rainforest of North America is the only such rainforest in the world. Everywhere else, rainforest exists only along the coast. The remaining old growth of the inland temperate rainforest is an immense carbon sink and reservoir to provide cooling and oxygen for the planet. It supplies and filters an estimated one-third of North America's fresh water. And, if we allow, it does it every second of the day, every day, all for free. Also, how do you put a value on the effect that a thousand-year-old forest has on the human spirit? It was all beautifully designed that way by nature, completely win-win. It will sustain us if we allow it to sustain itself. But so far, we have chosen that the primary significance of the inland temperate rainforest is that of a logging farm. Harvesting practices have allowed vast areas to be severely fragmented by large clear cuts. Google Earth is a great eye in the sky to reference. This limited approach has led to community confrontations, especially when water supply areas are logged. And those with no voice at all? Those that rely on us to provide stewardship for their home, the forest inhabitants? Well, in the worst case scenario, such as for the mountain caribou, they are facing extinction. To me, this signifies that we are likely tipping the balance and losing the win-win arrangement that has existed for us for thousands of years. But for now, let's go visit the Nkamaplu. The first time I heard of the Nkamaplu was when I saw this print. A narrow goat trail pinned to the side of sheer canyon walls. I could almost feel the froth of the water swollen below. And spurred on by rumors of gigantic old trees, I knew I had to explore this primeval valley. When I finally entered the canyon, it was apparent that not much had changed from a century earlier when the picture had been taken. It felt great to be finally entering the Incomable. As I entered the widening valley, I was struck by the green and the lush. It was also hot and humid. And there were no big trees in sight, anywhere. There was no cathedral forest, no ancient cedars. I was disappointed. The only reminder of the ancient forest that once covered this entire valley floor were gigantic stumps, hidden by fast-growing underbrush. So just how old are these stumps? Well, remember Craig the Mountain Man? Well, as you might expect, Craig has a lot of answers. Let's listen to what he has to say. Hi, I'm uh, Craig Pettit. I'm a director of the Valhalla Wilderness Society. Uh, back in the early 70s, I worked for the Forest Service as uh, an assistant ranger. Um, I've worked also for Parks Branch as a backcountry ranger. And over the years, um, worked in firefighting with the Ministry of Force, which brought me into this valley on some of the higher level force. But since 1990, I've been working uh, for the Valhalla uh, Society. The uh, Inconoplu Valley, where we're at now, is uh, the site of a very rich old forest uh, that's part of our Inland Temperate Rainforest Project and also part of our Selkirk Mountain Caribou Park proposal. Um, unfortunately, in the Inconoplu Valley, 35 kilometers of this valley have been clear cut. So my work has been generally in the fall when all the leaves fall off to go around looking for big stumps, trying to find ones with uh, enough or large enough sound face that we can cut a sample out of. In this uh, roughly seven or 65 centimeters, 
there were 696 annual rings in this piece, and that wasn't even getting to the center. We were roughly uh, 10 centimeters yet from the center. But that's one of the ways that we are trying to establish the ages of these trees. The, um, the Forest Service uh, says the maximum these trees can be is 800 years old. But my sampling work done in here over the last four or five years indicates that these trees can be upwards of 1,800 to 2,000 years old. So can it really be that some of these trees are up to 2,000 years old? Well, in the state of Idaho, at the Panhandle National Park, the U.S. Forest Service obviously concurs with Craig's research, as offered by this sign in their park. This grove of cedars, named after President Roosevelt, has been protected for almost a century. So let's put this into perspective. Around the time when the Roman Empire fell, some of the currently oldest trees in the Ankamaplu were likely already busy creating oxygen for this planet. 500 years later, at the start of the First Crusade, these trees could still be considered juvenile. When Christopher Columbus reached the New World, give or take a century or two, they celebrated their first millennium birthday surrounded by countless valley friends. And today, 500 years after that celebration, and now, like the late middle age or early senior, they stand quite alone, perhaps still in shock, having lost most of their friends just a few seconds ago in Nkamaplu time. Kilometer after kilometer, I pushed on to the choking brush. I crossed creeks on old bridges. I carefully crossed rocky washouts. And, when offered an opening through the bush, I would stop and take in all that that was around me. I could not help but notice how eroded the river banks were, and that no riparian zones seemed to have been left to protect the river embankments. To that day, 20 years after the valley had been initially clear-cut, the embankments were still sloughing, and spewing sediment into the waters that proved so deadly for fish stocks. My disappointment continued to deepen. Perhaps I was just too late, Perhaps all the thousand-year-old forest had been logged, and gigantic stumps were all that was left for me and everyone else to follow. When loggers first entered this valley, it took an entire team of men and horses to cut down one thousand-year-old titan. But modern harvesting techniques are super effective, and entire forests, regardless of the tree size, can now be clear-cut with great speed. So how much of the inland temperate rainforest has been affected by logging? Let's talk to Craig some more. Like I said, the man has a lot of answers. The first uh, project we did was to get a bird's eye view of what forest was left remaining. So we obtained satellite photographs that were current to the year 2000, had a GIS expert knit them all together to give us this bird's eye view of a thousand square kilometer area in the southeast corner of British Columbia. Now when you look at these maps, everything that you see in red has been clear-cut since 1960. Now, if you zero in on these areas, what you notice right away 
is that the valley bottoms have been heavily clear cut. And although there's large areas like this that aren't clear cut, the reason for it is they're high, they're alpine, and they're very steep slopes so that the economics of logging them will never happen. Uh, this is the Inconaplu River Valley that starts right up in the Asilowit Glacier of Glacier National Park. 35 kilometers of this valley bottom has been clear cut since 1960 and we're now looking at the final thousand hectares of valley bottom that the logging companies are proposing to log in. Um, this is after clear cutting 35 kilometers of majestic old growth to further cut the remnant force that's left in this area would be a crime against humanity. This is um, the logging company's map of the upper and Conaplu. It shows their cut block proposals for the upper and Conaplu. This is the final thousand hectares of operable forest remaining after 35 kilometers of this valley have been clear cut. Uh, the reason for showing this is that, yes, the logging company and the Ministry of Force do have plans to uh, log in this final uh, 1,000 hectares. On and on I continued, following the narrow corridor through the former clear cuts that now had mostly turned into this green desert of brush. So, guess what? The rumors are true. Thousand-year-old forest does still exist in the Incomaplu River Valley, and I have the extreme good fortune to find it. This is exactly what I've been searching for. Standing amongst the ancient cedars, I understand immediately why it is called a cathedral forest. For this truly is a place of reverence. This is a place of awe. And to me, this timeless forest, unaltered by human hand, is like a church without walls. As I wander around, I can't help but give in to my desire to reach out and to touch and to connect with the spirit of this primeval wood. I find myself enthralled and completely in the moment. I just continue to wander and explore and be. The circle of life is apparent with every footstep. 
the largest of trees providing shelter to the newest of seedlings. Nurse trees that surrender their being to future generations. Countless shapes and colors as can only be designed by the perfection of Mother Nature. and that soft carpet of rainforest moss so utterly green that covers all that remains stationary for a brief time well brief in a comma blue time that is I arrive at what I later come to learn is the magic pool. I stop and check in with myself. I feel humbled and uplifted, energized and calmed, inspired and unbelievably content. The energy level in this antique forest is amazingly balanced. And it occurs to me that just as human communities thrive, when all age groups participate in everyday life, so it must be essential for forest to be comprised of trees spanning a full range of ages to maintain its health in ways our modern science likely has yet to understand. Or perhaps, and this is my belief, we have just allowed ourselves to forget this understanding. In time, my attention comes to rest on the abundance of colors that reflect off the pool in front of me. I slowly realize that though the surface tension of the pool never breaks, the limestone bottom is beautifully alive. Please join me in discovering the depths of the magic pool.
That night, as I lay peacefully on the forest floor, snuggled in my tent, I basked in deep gratitude for sharing in the magnificence of this mystic valley. And the Nkama Blue Choir seemed to resonate their agreement. So is it just me, or does it not seem inherently wrong to be harvesting ancient rainforest when there's such little left now? How can that be legal? To find the answer, I talked to registered professional biologist Rachel Holt. So one of the difficulties in, in, in protecting old growth is actually deciding what old growth is out there, and um, we do have a good, good mapping of forests in British Columbia. Um, but what it, it stops at 250 years of age. So any trees that are older than that, they get lumped into this one big category of trees greater than 250 years of age. And as a result of that, we basically have policies that don't differentiate between these types of forests. So you can be 2,000 years old and you get the same treatment basically as something that's 250 years old. So if you're looking for areas to protect, um, it, it doesn't distinguish, it doesn't, it doesn't give any special protection to those ancient forests. So, in a nutshell, the ancient rainforest is currently not separately identifiable, and therefore is not protected due to inadequate policy. My attraction to the remaining in Kamaplu old growth is predominantly a spiritual connectedness state that I am blessed with when inside its borders. But what is the environmental impact, whether local or global, of further clear-cutting old-growth tempered rainforest? One of the issues around harvesting a stand, uh, particularly in this wet environment, is even under normal circumstances, if you, if you cut down those big trees, you change the local climate. It used to be moist and cool if you walk in there on a summer day, it's cool. Um, if you cut those trees down, suddenly it's really warm at the, at the ground level. You change the understory plants. You change how those trees regenerate and grow back. The little trees, they, they basically, they're, they're adapted to regrowing in those cool conditions and um, under normal circumstances, sometimes can have a significantly hard time regrowing back in those sites. If you couple that with climate change and increase the temperature and decrease the amount of water they're getting, then you can really significantly change the system. So what used to be a cedar forest can become um, a lodgepole pine forest or some other kind of forest and um, that's all fine, that's how nature works, except that those cedar forests are entirely unique and have a whole bunch of species associated with them. So what you effectively do is you, you speed up the rate at which climate change affects the landscape and the biodiversity. And what we really need to be doing is slowing that down because that's the only way we can hope that things will actually be able to adapt to the amount of change that we predict is coming. Um, and biodiversity is the you know, natural systems and, and um, grizzly bears and caribou and insects and lichens. This is what British Columbia is really famous for. Um, we have some of the last remaining intact systems well, in North America, but in much of the developed world, um, British Columbia really is amazing for that. And this is what we need to be thinking about how we're going to manage to keep these systems over the, over the coming climate change years. The more time I spent in the old growth, the more I realized just how radically different this forest was from the replanted clear-cut sections of the valley. I decided to ask Rachel, how long would it take for some semblance of the former rainforest to return? I mean, we've always harvested forest with the idea that you're going to replace it with something that's ecologically appropriate um, so that the critters that used to live there can live there. Well, in this kind of case, irrespective of the age of that stand, it's quite likely that you're really not going to get that forest back at all. Um, so from an adaptation point of view, you're seriously um, decreasing the resilience of, of the whole landscape um, and we, we've already done that because we've harvested a significant amount of that 
and we have no real idea of what what the ultimate effect of that is going to be but um, it certainly is a reasonable science argument for, for maintaining these remaining stands. On my numerous return visits to the Ankama Plu, Craig guided us into the far reaches of the old growth. Deeper and deeper we explored, through the man-sized ferns and the thorny devil's club. We carefully scouted the river embankments, We followed ancient grizzly bear trails through overgrown avalanche chutes. And would often stop to admire the views all around us. And, of course, we took every chance possible to connect with the big trees. As always, Craig freely shared his intimate knowledge of the rainforest as we hiked. So that's these old growth forests are huge carbon sinks. So they're very important in uh, the scheme of global warming and uh, carbon storage. And uh, uh, they're some of our best carbon storage areas that we have in the world. If you look at the kind of forests that we're talking about here, which are basically undisturbed forests that have been sequestering carbon for X thousands of years or so, um, the amount of carbon stored in those forests is huge. It's, they're, they're, e they're equal to the largest stores of carbon any found anywhere in the world. Um, basically the coastal temperate rainforest, these types of inland temperate rainforests are equivalent to the eucalypt forests of Australia, which are um, they're up there, basically they're number one in terms of actual solid storage of carbon in the trees themselves, massive amounts of carbon stored in the soil. Um, and so if you, if you, if you harvest those trees, um, you're basically causing a, a large and immediate uh, release of carbon into the, into, the, into the active carbon pool, which is the thing contributing to climate change. So when we cut down these trees, we impact everybody. We impact everybody. Now they're probably in the years to come when they are more able to put a dollar on carbon, carbon storage sinking. and sinking, that these are going to become very, very important for us. Craig discussed how international scientists had recently discovered not only rare, but seven entirely new to science lichen species within the remaining old growth of the Ankama Plu. Lichens are one of the main food sources for the endangered mountain caribou. He also pointed out the Lozelle's toy blade, an orchid rarely found in western North America. I was always curious to have first time visitors that accompanied me to the valley share their thoughts and experiences of the inland temperate rainforest. When we first went through the, uh, across the bridge and came into here, it felt like we were going into another, uh, it felt like we were going into uh, have another time period or um, into another world almost. It felt like we should be watching out for velociraptors, not grizzly bears. When I heard about the forest, it's, on how old it was, and since there's not many uh, forests like this anymore, since they've been clear-cutted so much, I figured it'd be something to see in case anything ever happened to it. it. Seems like it's really sad that we've got spots like this, and they're cutting down trees to make fence posts. It's like every day we wake up, we um, go wash our face, hop on the computer, and we're just kind of going through the motions, not really there. Well, not entirely, but a lot of the time we're just not really paying that much attention. Not really present. 
But when we, but when you go to places like this, where it's just so untouched, and you, when you find out that there's so little of it and so much of it's been clear cut, it just makes it yeah, just kind of freaks me out. People don't pay attention to this. It's places like this, like last treasures we have, for lack of a better word. They're um, so rare, and there's only so many forests like this. And if they're gone, they're gone forever, and we'll never get them back. And I feel like we should be paying more attention to things like this instead of our cell phones and Facebook pages. It should be about where we live and who we are and what we care about. I feel like this is something we have to take care of. It's something that we've, we've been, we are the caretakers of and we should protect it from turning into flat ground and just young brush rather than these beautiful ancient trees. And there's some caribou that used to live here, mountain caribou, they're quite an endangered species. And uh, with the clear cutting they were losing so much habitat because they eat the lichens off the older trees and the younger trees can't support it because there just isn't enough um, canopy and moisture for it. So the uh, caribou, where they're just, they were like, slowly um, getting smaller and smaller uh, population, and of course, uh, the government had this plan to start hunting the wolves and grizzlies and other uh, predatory animals that eat them. So, firstly, that doesn't make sense to me because you don't, if something's going down, you don't destroy the other um, factors. You give it a safer, safer habitat. It's up to us to um, save them and let them be. The endangered mountain caribou are critically dependent on large, continuous tracts of old-growth forest for food and shelter. The caribou sustain themselves primarily on tree-inhabiting lichens during winter. These lichens grow very slowly and are abundant only in old forests. For comparison, the globally known endangered giant panda of China is estimated to have 1,600 animals left in the wild. Now consider that the lesser known mountain caribou of Canada have only 1,600 to 1,700 animals left in the wild. Approximately 98% of the world's mountain caribou live in British Columbia, which does not have its own provincial endangered species laws. I never knew that we had an interior rainforest. Mm -hmm. I'd heard about coastal rainforest and I had gone to uh, look at some of the old growth. To hear that there was old growth here um, and also that it was threatened, uh, I was very intrigued to, to find out a little bit about it, to experience it, to see it. Um, mm -hmm. It's stunning. It's, it's mind-blowing. Um, it's any, it unlike anything else we've ever seen before, huh? Mm -hmm. um, it's very moving. There is... You can't deny a presence mm. in that forest. You can't deny um, just a, a sense of calm. And, and when you start to look around and you realize that it's not just trees that are you know, over a thousand years old, almost two thousand years old, it's what they're growing on. They're growing on the old trees that, you know, did the same thing. And what's, what's disturbing is that without any of this experience, we, I, place, I place a certain amount of trust in in our government, in our regulations that are going to protect what we have, that are going to um, recognize what we have. And I've, I've always just assumed that the forest practices had, had 
become better, had, had improved, had modernized, had recognized the value of, of things. And then you see this. And you see the clear cut. And, uh, and you see that despite, I don't even believe it's good intentions. Despite efforts to plant and to, you know, pr create a succession, it doesn't, it doesn't come back. It doesn't come back to, you know, how easily we are led to believe. We hear of buying carbon credits and, and of, you know, stopping people in Brazil from tearing down rainforests because of the, the effect that it will have on the earth. And yet in our own backyards, mm. we're unaware. We were unaware that uh, that this is still happening um, and it's disturbing and people need to know this habitat this this gift is endangered the lichens the mushrooms the the insects, the everything that lives here. There is an opportunity here for for tourism, for recreation, for education. There's a spiritual value. Two days in here and I don't think I'll ever forget it. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know what I can do to protect it. I left the cool and soft air of the antique cover for the last time and started back through the barrage of the green desert clear cuts. With every branch slap against my vehicle, I felt the echoes of the rooted nation that had until recently lived here. I decided to make one final stop at a place I've nicknamed the Pile. A retired forester told me when the Nkama plue was clear-cut, only the best of the best timber was driven to the mills. The majority of the ancient rainforest was actually buried or piled up and burnt. The three stories of evidence that I am sitting on is one such waste pile that escaped the matches. To me, the Ankamaplu is a metaphor for how we are treating much of our planet. And, in consideration of those yet to come, I cannot help but wonder how much further we are willing to draw down nature's bank account. Progress at any cost is starkly visible in the clear cuts of the Ankamaplu, while the value we place on continuity clings precariously to the branches of a few remaining ancient trees. Unrestrained growth has located the limits of our planet now. 
Many of us are awash in materialism, yet still seek. I would like to suggest how important it is to stand in support of that which truly empowers and wonders us, which in turn inspires others to stand in their truth. In my experience, to become aware of the one energy that is common to all amplifies compassion and connection to nature. In parting, please allow me to share from sunrise to sunset one final day of enchantment in the life of the Nkamapalu River Valley. Beach by your fire.